Welcome to Working the Word Series 2. In last week's episode, we looked at the fruit of the Spirit in the life of a Christian. The evidence that a person has the Holy Spirit is the fruit. In today's episode, we're going to look at something that's closely related and yet clearly distinct. The gifts of the Holy Spirit in the life of a Christian. Paul wrote to the church in Corinth a couple of times and in chapter 12 of his first letter, he wrote to them, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. Some translations have ignorant. Mm. If I have to write to you and say, look, I don't want you to be uninformed on this topic. It's kind of a really clear implication that there's some bits of knowledge they're missing at the very least. They just haven't quite got it. And so Paul here is going to give a whole chapter and then another chapter and then another chapter. And by some of what he says, we can get a little bit of a glimpse of some of what they didn't have right and what he's directly correcting in this situation. So in approaching this topic, we're not wanting to suggest that we, we think you're uninformed. <laughs> but would like to just explore the topic and the difference that it makes in the life, understanding the gifts that God has given to us. And I think realistically, even if, you know, this is something you study, there's always more things to learn. And to think about mm. what is it that God's put on my heart? And if there's a process of, like, of letting God develop his will in your life that this, this is a distinct part of that process. In last week's episode, when we looked at the fruit of the Spirit, we, we saw them as evidence of having the Holy Spirit. They're, they're qualities of character, love, joy, peace, gentleness, kindness, faithfulness, self-control. If you're soaking your life and your purpose in God and his character and the Holy Spirit, this is, this is just what's going to happen. This is the fruit of that. And, and everybody is going to possess the fruit. Mm. Or ideally, be working toward that direction. <laughs> well, you know, seed, mm. growth, growing fruit is something that just continues to mature. And the, there's a consistency in in how it looks in, you know, the, if, if you've got this fruit, then it's going to look kind of the same because, you know, you're, you're reflecting the character of the same God. It's making us into loving and lovable Christians. Mm. And Jesus said, by their fruit, you will know them. Which is one of the th places where I think a lot of people initially come unstuck when we get to gifts because the gift isn't supposed to be the identification. And I think that's a really important point. That the, the gift is something that God gives in a situational or, you know, to, to fulfil a purpose, but it's not the evidence that, you have the spirit. So what do we mean by, by gifts? Gifts are abilities that God gives to us through the Holy Spirit. When we're born again, you know, it's a little bit like there are some things you get from mum and dad, a little bit of genetics and a little bit of growing up. And, and this is like that, except it comes from our Heavenly Father through the Holy Spirit when we give our life to him. And I think there's also an aspect of like, you know, some of it is inherently given at that point. Other is, others of it may only be given temporarily in a situational place, like, you know, giving you the gifts you need for this situation. Like, you know, it's, it's not necessarily a, a when you become a Christian, that's it. Like, <laughs> In fact, we will notice an example mm. where a person had one group of gifts. And then th there's clearly evidence that that others were developing. And later on, he's known by a totally different group of gifts. The whole purpose of the gifts is to bless and to serve others. They're not given to make us look good. Which I think is actually one of the really strong flags in terms of how we evaluate this, mm -hmm. in that if it's, you know, for, for proving something or for self-promotion, if you're getting more power or profit or anything from it, then it's not being used in a, that, that's not a good thing. And it could be a misuse of the mm. gift. It could be a counterfeit gift. Um, our gifts won't all be the same. 
The, the fruit, we, we want to see the, the same thing developing. But we're, with the gifts, we're all going to be different. We need to be different. <laughs> we're going to complement each mm. other. And that's, I think, one of the things that when you sort of start looking at, at how it works, at, you know, why the Holy Spirit gives these gifts to, to address specific needs or to fulfill functions, you, you start understanding why there's sort of a combination because they're all supposed to work together. And they actually create a place for each one of us. But the caution is, the gifts can be counterfeited. If the devil was to counterfeit the fruit of the spirit, he would undo himself. <laughs> you know, if Satan started to make us all loving and joyful and peaceful and kind, and he would undo. There's no himself. point. There's no point. But the, it's very clear in Scripture that the gifts have been in the past counterfeited. Mm. <clears throat> So, bottom line, you know, we're going to discover that there are so many different ways that we can serve God that I don't have to try and be like you. And that there isn't one that's more important or less important, that, you know, God gives you the gifting that you need in your space right now. And he gives us a combination of gifts mm. and we actually need each other. And I think one of the things that he was writing to, particularly in the Corinthians that we'll get to, is that they had a preference for all the gifts that involved inspired speech. You know, you've got the gift of tongues and, and prophecy and, and, you know, the, the people who are up front and, and you can see, like, that, those are the gifts they're valuing. So that's what he's addressing in Corinthians. Whereas it's not like we have a few lists and in those lists we get kind of a glimpse at what was being addressed in that place, but that also suggests that not necessarily all of the gifts that are are in these lists, because the situ you know the Holy Spirit gives according to the situation. And we can go back to some examples of mm. ones that aren't in these lists. Yeah. So last week we said, well, we quoted Jesus saying, "You will recognize them by their fruit." And then he said, "Not everyone who says to me." Lord, Lord, is going to enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven, and if the fruit is given by him to be our character qualities, this is his will. And then he went on and he said, on that day, and I think he's talking about the last days, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Gift. Mm -hmm. And cast out demons in Jesus' name, prophesying, casting out demons, miracles. And Jesus says to them, I never knew you. So the gifts on their own are not evidence that a mm. person has the Holy Spirit. The, the danger is that they can be counterfeited. And if you're separating the gifts out from the fruit, that's, that's majorly problematic. And in two of the cases where he talks really specifically about the gifts the fruit is, is right next to it. <laughs> it, it is. Je Jesus did warn, he said, look, there'll be false Christ and false prophets. So just because a person claims to speak from God or on behalf of Jesus doesn't make them from God. And in some cases, you know, if God is, is able to be speaking to and convicting people, he doesn't necessarily need to come through another person. And, you know, if somebody comes up to you and says, God told me to tell you this, the, there's kind of, there's a lot of potential for manipulation or, mm -hmm. or, you know, this is my will, but if I add God to it, then it will, like, you know, there's a lot of ways that can be used in a manipulative or abusive way. It's interesting that he, he separates out false prophets. He doesn't say mm -hmm. there won't be prophets. Just the false ones. We have to be discerning and know the difference between true and false. Mm -hmm. And again, perform great signs and wonders, miracles. To the point of, you know, leading astray, if possible, even God's people. So the gifts of the Spirit, miracles, prophecy, all of that is not the evidence that a person has the Holy Spirit. The evidence is always the fruit. The fruit. And we need to be careful that we don't make some of the gifts of the Spirit into the fruit of the Spirit. And I think sometimes even just keeping the focus that it is not for 
self-promotion, not for profit, not for, you know, power, gaining power or anything, that these gifts are be, to be used helping each other and building each other up. So it's not, look at me, look what I can do. I think, like, you know, that, that kind of keeps it anchored within the fruits as well and, and keeps some of the that tendency to, you know, be led astray by the false prophets or signs and wonders and things because it's not about showiness. It's about building each other up if the gifts are being used properly. And again, in Corinthians, Second Corinthians, Paul mm. talks about people who are false apostles, mm. disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. So the appearance of what looks like a gift is not the evidence that a person has the Holy Spirit. And I think this is when you were referencing. Yeah, that he, he sort of, you know, he talks about these gifts, but then comes to talking about something he's, that just kind of, you know, and now I will show you the most excellent way. Mm -hmm. Like there's the gifts, but <laughs> this is the important bit. And we'll come back to those previous verses. Mm. We're going to look at this and then we're going to go back to the big. Be because I think it needs to really be anchored in this, that this is the key point. Mm -hmm. And he says, look, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, gift, but have not love, mm -hmm. fruit, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have prophetic powers, gift. And understand all mysteries, gift. And all knowledge, gift. And if I have all faith, gift, so as to remove mountains, but have not love, fruit, fruit I'm nothing. If I give all that I have and if I deliver my body to be burned, you know, gift, gift but have not love, fruit, I gain nothing. And Paul is really clear that there's a difference between gift mm -hmm. and fruit. And fruit is the evidence that we have the Holy Spirit. And I think one of the things where the Corinthians were going a little bit astray is that they were overemphasizing the gifts, specific subset of gifts, and some of the fruit were being a little bit lost. But the fruit was very much <laughs> missing. So let, let's go back to the beginning of 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And we're going to follow this through for a while. And you can either watch the verses on the screen or you can compare them in your own translation. It's always good to check up on us. <laughs> and notice what Paul writes in verse 4. He says, now there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. You've almost kind of got hints of, of the spread of the Trinity here, that you've got this, the spirit and gifts, you've got service and Lord, you've got activities and God that you're getting kind of glimpses that what is being given is character traits expressive of the character of God. And, and gifts for service. Mm. And there is variety. And there needs to be. And, and God is not predictable as we wish he was. <laughs> that he gives them to everyone, but there's variety. Mm. That it's a diversity of abilities, and yet the one God. And sometimes we can we don't always see the diversity because we're seeing kind of the two or three that are up the front, as opposed to all of the other ones. But all of them play a part. And sometimes we've sort of neglected this topic. Mm. Either neglected it or over overemphasized overemphasized it to the neglect of the fruit of the spirit. Verse 7 carries on, and it, this is a really important verse, mm. to each, each. So it's not that I get some gifts and you don't. Mm. And, and there can be a degree of elitism that comes with that in terms of, you know, who has the, the gifts and who doesn't have the gifts. That's not the question. It's that everybody has gifts. It's what are yours. And are you using the ones that you have or are you just sitting there envious of the ones that, 
your neighbour has. And to be fair, it, it can take some time to figure out what yours are, particularly if there are some that are really obvious and easy to spot. And yours, it hasn't been one that's been sort of as easy to spot and as a, made aware of. It can be, you know, it might just be part of the process that you haven't figured that figured your spot out yet. Mm -hmm. But the, the truth is that God has given each of his children mm. something. Yeah, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. And I think keeping it in that focus that, you know, if it is not for the common good, then it's there's something wrong. That, you know, the, it's bestowed individually, but the benefit is for the community. And I think that's critical. Mm. That if I am using the gift to make me look good, you know, look what I can do. Then it is at best a misuse of that gift. And it can be something that's really countercultural. Like we're living in a world, particularly in Western society, where individualism is starting to be a much, much stronger thing as opposed to, you know, a community minded where we help each other and the common good is, you know, we'll, we'll make individual service and sacrifice for the common good. Now, there is, there is still a balance to be had there, but if we're focusing on the individualism, we're going to miss some of the, the most important ways that God is trying to work. And if we're focusing on look at me. Mm. Paul now begins to list some of the gifts. Mm -hmm. And no two of the lists in the New Testament are identical. But he says, to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom. That sounds pretty important. Yeah. To another, the utterance of knowledge, according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the ability to distinguish between spirits. A critical one. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. We begin to get the sense that there's an enormous range of... And this is just kind of a little snapshot in the middle. This is just a small part of the list that's in because the Bible. Because it's also, he's addressing a specific situation here. Mm-hmm. And suggests that a whole lot of people here are getting different abilities. And then he begins just to explore it using the, the metaphor of a body. Yeah. A body is one and has many members. Well, I guess there's fingers and toes and hands and arms and legs. I think there's a small degree of humour in his writing here. Like, you know, if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it wouldn't, you know, he, he kind of, he's, he's trying to make his point in a way that makes it really obvious that, you know, the eye cannot say to the hand, I do not need you. You've, you've got this, when you're sort of seeing it in that terms, you can understand how all of the bits are important, even if, you know, this, this can't see things. That's okay. That's not supposed to see things, but this can't actually help when, you know. So this can see that there's a need, but can't do anything. And this, this, <laughs> this can't see that there's a need. But can actually do something. And so you've got to have them working together and that connection and that sort of, you know, all the parts working together. And then you've got some parts that you can't see. Mm. But if you haven't got them... <laughs> you have big problems. <laughs> and he says, so it is. Um, he says, all of these are empowered by one and the same spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. Which is kind of a little bit boggling, but also really amazing when you think about it, that each one of these gifts is kind of individually tailored. To, to, you know, this situation, like, you know, you are gifted with things that help your community and your family in your space. Like it is designed for you and, and who you are and what you bring to the community. And so really this is God working in the community. It is. Through his body. In fact, he says, look, in one spirit we were all baptised into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free were all made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but many. And so he talks about 
the arrangement of the parts of the body. And then in verse 18, he says, as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. That in the end, the gifts are not, I want this gift, I demand this gift. Or even I ask for this gift. Like, you know, yes, there, there can be some, but I think asking for the fruit is is kind of more key. And in terms of instead of necessarily needing to know what your gift is so you can kind of go out and do that, use going out and doing it to shape and guide growing your gift. And being part of the body because the gifts are not about my character. Mm. They're about how we work together for the kingdom of God. We may think that the talent or the gift that God's given to us is big. We may think that it's small. But I'm reminded of the time there was a garbage strike. And we discovered that the people who have what we would maybe consider a, a less than nice job were actually very critical. That whether our talent is big or small, we need to dedicate it to God's service <clears throat> and we need to recognise the right of everyone else to use the gifts that God's given to them. And we can't look and say, God, you can't give that gift to that person. And I think God smiles and says, oh, yeah. And, and even in t terms of, like, you know, recognising what gifts other people have, being even just being open to that, which we started this quarter with, really, mm -hmm. in, in terms of the concept of looking to see where God is already at work. Again, we've got that here that, you know, looking to see what gifts God already has in place and recognising and nurturing those gifts in other people as well as looking to see where he's guiding us as well. And, and encouraging them to use it rather than mm. saying, well, you know, I don't understand your gift, please don't. <laughs> don't, don't uh, yes. <laughs> and so he comes around and he's about to go through and he's got a, a slightly different list of gifts mm -hmm. this time. But he says, look, you, and that's all of us, are the body of Christ, individually members of it, and God has appointed in the church apostles, second, prophets, third, teachers, then miracles, <clears throat> gifts of healing, helping, administrating, not one of my strengths, and various kinds of tongues. And like, you know, if you were sort of trying to do all of that work, it would be exhausting and overwhelming and you'd not get anything done. Or you'd burn out. <laughs> Whereas, you know, kind of that, that some people are designed to be administrators. Some people are designed to be teachers. And, you know, if, if your gifting is teaching, then putting that person in administration isn't going to be, go well for anybody, really. And how often we do it. And, and you know, there's people that love doing the finances. Mm. And there's others that loathe it. Here, here's a whole range of, of gifts. And Paul has a question. He says, you know, are, are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers, do all work miracles, do all possess gifts of healing, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret? And the implication is that the answer to these is? No. No. <laughs> that there's a whole range of abilities that God gives to us to work and together. And I think this is one of his key points because the Corinthians have been overemphasizing a couple of gifts to mm -hmm. the to the detriment of, of recognising some of the others. And, you know, he follows this straight on with, with going, going into love in much greater depth. Yeah, here's that verse. <laughs> Earnestly desire the higher gifts, and I'll show you a more excellent way. And that's where he goes into. Into that. If I speak in the tongues of men and angels but have not love, if I've got the, the gifts but not the fruit, mm. I'm nothing. And when he's finished the love chapter, he comes into chapter 14. Mm-hmm. And he transitions back. He says, pursue love, fruit, and earnestly desire spiritual gifts. And he flags there the gift of prophecy, mm. which wasn't the one that they were putting high esteem on. 
Uh, and yet the one they were putting, like, you know, as he sort of goes on to explore, the one they were putting high esteem on wasn't being used to build up the body, whereas, you know, the gift of prophecy in this case was much more a building up of the mm -hmm. body. It was, you know, growing and understanding, whereas the tongues were kind of a little bit more of an individual. It was almost, look at me, look what mm -hmm. I can do. When the gift was really given for out in the marketplace. Mm. And particularly with, you know, how he's progressed this, like he, he's talked about all of the gifts being important, not just a couple. He's talked about, you know, love being at the core of it. And now he's getting to this where he's really sort of nailing in on this, that this isn't this. That you can't say, well, look, you know, there's one super gift and this is the one that you mm -hmm. all need to have. He said, you know, there's some really good ones there and it's not bad to desire that you can prophesy. Um, he follows it through and down in verse 12. So with yourselves, since you are eager for manifestations of the Spirit, strive to excel in building up the church. Mm -hmm. And it always comes back to that, that building up the church or building up the body of believers or helping each other at a most basic level, that it, it always comes back to that, that if you have this gift and you're not using it to help. Mm-hmm. It comes back to verse 7 of chapter 12, that these are given for the, the common good yeah. and not for individual edification. We're going to jump now to Romans, and Romans has got a different list. Peter's got another list. Ephesians has another list. Which kind of suggests that if there were a list being made Today, you know, if there was an apostle alive today giving a list, it would probably, again, look different because the needs in, in each situation are different and the gifts are given according to need, not according to kind of posterity or anything. Okay, so, so the variance between the lists could be because the needs in each particular church. Well, there isn't going to be a one-size-fits-all. Like the needs that a, a large city church, for example, is going to have is going to be different slightly different to the needs that a small church is going to have. And I wonder if the needs during COVID mm. are, are going to be different. And I think it sort of comes back to, you know, that some gifts are temporary, that are given temporarily to get you through a moment or a time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that, that the spirit might be moving here and giving gifts to help us move through this time that are sort of, you know, special edition kind of ones. Or maybe stepping us up. Could it be that there's a spiritual gift called media? That they didn't have quite the same way in the first century. And again, it's like if you're looking at, you know, what are the needs and how can I help, basically, then what you're going to see is going to be the needs that are in the community around you that the Spirit is kind of going, this, this is where I want you. And he's likely to give us the gift for the need that he's let us to see. Not necessarily the gift that sort of matches <laughs> word for word the, the, what was needed back then. All right, so here we are, we're moving into Peter. First Peter chapter 4. And in verse 10, it, it's very similar to what Paul was writing to the Corinthians. Mm. As each has received a gift... It's not a select few. Each mm. has received a gift. Use it to serve one another. And I think that's one of those flags. Mm. If a gift is being used for personal purposes. Then there's a, that, that should flow up, throw up flags. It should show a red flag because the gifts are given to serve one another. Mm. as good stewards of, and here he's got it again, God's varied grace. Whoever speaks, as one who speaks the oracles of God. So speaking mm. can be a, a spiritual gift. Whoever serves, as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. And I think in some of this, again, we're getting glimpses of God's character. Jesus didn't come down to service to get attention. He came down to service to service. That it was, a, you know, it's that God is expressing his character through in us through these gifts. Mm -hmm. And our use of them 
is to show his character. Mm. Not, not, hi, look at me. <laughs> because, you know, we, we have it here. In order that, you know, that's always one of those little phrases, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Paul in Romans 12 also picks up on the theme of, of spiritual gifts. And like in Corinthians, he talks about members of a body. Picking it up in verse 4, as in one body. We have many members. And the members do not have the same function. So we, though many, a one body in Christ and individually members of one of another. Having gifts that differ. And I don't know that you can say it too much plainer than that. Yes. Uh, according to the grace given, let, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to faith, if serving in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts, that encourages mm -hmm. in his encouragement, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. And I think there's something that sort of like could almost slip by in this verse, but you know, if it is contributing to the need of others, I'm reading from a different translation, obviously, um, let him give generously. Mm -hmm. um, if it is leading, let him go diligently, that it is also possible to be stingy, to be lazy, to be um, mm -hmm. inconsistent, that y y we can have these gifts, but it still requires the work to develop. And talking at this, you know, if he would say, you know, with zeal, if... It's the, automatic. Yeah. And, and one of the risks that we can run is that we kind of don't spend the time developing or even, you know, feeling inadequate because my gifts are not that gift or, you know, the danger of elitism because this gift is, is fancy and my gift isn't or... Or covetousness, I wish I could do what... That person can do. And you, you very much here got this focus on the gifts you are given to the best of your ability. Mm -hmm. um, and again, it comes back to, you know, the acts of mercy with cheerfulness. You've got that fruit of the spirit always underpinning the gifts. And perhaps we need to know that, you know, giving, contributing, mm. we can all give, but some people have been gifted in such a way that they can give more. Mm. And enjoy doing it and get a get satisfaction out of it. Whereas if you're giving and feeling stingy and, and kind of not really wanting to give, it's probably not your gift. Like it, it doesn't mean that giving is important in this case still, but it's probably not your gift. Mm. Another list is found in Ephesians chapter 4. And this is a, probably a, a leadership cluster of gifts mm. because it talks about Jesus having ascended to heaven, giving gifts to the church on earth. And it says he gave apostles and prophets, evangelists and shepherd teachers, pastor teachers, it's like that one is two gifts. It's not shepherds and teachers, it's yeah. shepherd teachers. And, and that like teaching is supposed to be about kind of a combination where you're, you're guiding people and growing them rather than dumping knowledge. Mm -hmm. In fact, verse 12 adds that the whole purpose of these gifts is not for themselves but to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. Mm. That... An apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher who is doing it all but not equipping people and not engaging people and drawing them along in work of ministry. Isn't really using their gifts. 
And sometimes it's really easy to see, you know, the professional people, the people who have these, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, shepherds, teachers, as kind of the ones doing the ministry. But this it kind of indicates that these are the ones to equip everyone else for ministry. And ministry is done by the whole group, not by... Which is kind masses. of a shift in focus to, to the way we often see it these days. It's quite radical, actually. Mm. And the goal is building up the body of Christ. That's not the work of the pastor. It's not the work of the evangelist. It's not work of the apostle or the prophet. Building up the body of Christ is the work of the church. Of everybody. And these people have giftings to encourage and nurture and lead for that to happen. Mm. Until we all attain to unity of the faith. And writing to some of the churches Paul had to write to, <laughs> unity was something that was challenging. And it's a theme that's popped up in, in quite a few of the places that you've got the fruit and the, the gifts and unity kind of all mm -hmm. interplay and, and needing to keep those in the right balance. And clearly a bunch of the places he was writing to didn't have that balance right. And, and the fruit or to be contributing to unity. Mm. And the gifts should not be leading to disunity because my gift's better than your gift. And there's a degree to which you can find that unity in the, the fruit that you've got all of these character traits, the united, but you've each sort of got new, like different pieces to bring to the puzzle. And if one of those pieces is missing, the puzzle can't be. Mm -hmm. That, you know, even if your piece doesn't seem like, you know, a, an important piece, it's still an important piece of that puzzle. And I think we've all put together jigsaws. <laughs> with a bit missing. <laughs> where you get, get to the end of it and you discover there's one piece missing. And like, you know, it's only one piece. It doesn't seem that significant. And yet. Yeah, you can see what the, the broad picture is. And yet it's, it's incomplete. It's still incomplete. So here are these people with gifts given to develop the people of God. So that we're no longer children tossed to and fro by the waves, carried about by every wind of doctrine, by every theory that comes along. And I think there is almost a degree of anchoring within these gifts as well. Yeah. In that, you know, as you're growing and developing your gift and, and learning to understand it and learning to work in God's will even more, it anchors you more within like, yes, there's a growing maturity and a growing ability to work within that, but it's also anchoring you within your relationship and within, you know, the fruit that God is, is growing into you. And with that stability, you know, he's got rather. Mm -hmm. We're not going to be tossed to and fro like a cork on a, an ocean, but speaking the truth in love, we're to grow up in every way into him who's the body, that is Christ, from whom the whole body jointed and held together by every joint with which it's equipped. When each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Fruit. <laughs> we always keep coming back. The important thing is not the gifts. Even at the beginning, rather speaking the truth in, in love. love. <laughs> You mean it's possible to speak the truth in the novel? Oh, yes. <laughs> you know, when we look at these, the purpose of the gift is very practical. It's for the benefit of the whole group. That They're not theoretical constructs. They're very practical, useful. And perhaps we could even think about you know, the gift of tongues on the day of Pentecost. You had people in Jerusalem from all over the world mm. speaking many different languages. And yet they're able to get up and speak a message that all of them understood. It crosses a language barrier to bring people to Jesus. Mm. And we find it again when Peter goes to Cornelius and takes some Jewish brothers with him. And they hear them in their own language praising God. And it happens again. In each occasion that it happens in the book of Acts, it's crossing a language barrier to... It's almost an anti-Babel kind of moment, that it's, it's breaking up that separation by language. 
So the Tower of Babel, God split them and... This, this is kind of almost a reversal of that. that the gift of tongues. Ev- yeah. Even if you have different languages, you can still kind of, you know, work together and be united and, you know, th- there's something really special there. And, and you and I have worked in churches where we functioned in multiple languages. Mm. Um, and it was necessary in order to cover... Um, and language can be a huge, huge barrier. Mm-hmm. And so that was God's intent. And if we see the need, mm. and I recall a time when we had a set of Bible studies in a language other than English, and we had people in our community with that, and they were so bad we had to scan them and edit them. And I don't know how, but I was able to actually edit them get the drift of the language, put it together, and people were baptised because of it. It's a very practical gift. And again, that could be something that is, you know, specifically situationally given, that there is a need and God gives the gift to be able to to do what is needed for that. And I still don't speak that language. So <laughs> it, it was an enabling mm. to perform a ministry. And it seems to me that's what the gifts are about, and enabling to perform a ministry. And, and there's such a wide range that we, we've talked about. <laughs> this is only a small, small range of what there is. And, and the, there's so much more. The important thing is that we not neglect the abilities that God's given to us. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you've had the experience of doing a clean out and discovering a gift that you were given many years ago and that you'd never opened. (laughs) Wouldn't it be sad if if God had given to us a gift and we never took the time to stop and to open it? And I think even something like the parable that Jesus tells about the talents, Mm -hmm. that you know, if you you can kind of try and protect it so that nothing bad happens to it, but realistically you're supposed to take it out and use it, even if that's risky, it's given to you to use. And the ones who used? Get more. Got more. And Paul wrote to Timothy, he said, don't neglect the gift you have, which was given to you by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. But even just in this, I think there's a really powerful moment where Paul is affirming you have a gift. Mm-hmm. Use your gift. That you know, it's it's very sort of under like it's paying attention to somebody and going, you know, I see your gift, nurturing that gift, encouraging that gift. So let, let's look at some of the examples of people using their gifts in the Bible. Mm-hmm. And sometimes we think the gifts of the Spirit are just something that's New given <laughs> in the New Testament, you know, in the, the book of Acts. And we know that has to be wrong because Jesus said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me and you know, to minister to the poor. And he talked about them all. But we can go back to the book of Exodus, chapter 31. The situation here, they're about to build a tabernacle. Mm -hmm. And the Lord said to Moses, See, I've called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur. He even knows his ancestry. I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with ability and intelligence, with knowledge and craftsmanship to devise artistic divines, to work in gold, silver and bronze in cutting stones for setting and in carving wood to work every craft. And then he lists a whole lot of people that are appointed to work with him. That's not a gift that's listed in the New Testament. Not really, but, and, and yet sort of this gift of craftsmanship, even you know, being able to, to create things with your hands mm-hmm. um, is clearly something that is, has played a role all the way through. That there's gifts that we haven't imagined sometimes. And, and I think sometimes we try and limit it to the list in the New Testament rather than understanding that they were situationally given and, and the way the spirit can work and move is, is much more broad than that. He's not sort of limited to, 
to whatever was was written down a, <laughs> a, a couple thousand years ago. But in this case, there's a need. Mm. We need to work with gold, we need to work with silver, we need to work with all sorts of craftsmen sort of things. And the Spirit of God gave this group of people... The, the skills they needed. The skills they needed. Now, I'm just hoping because the very next chapter is the golden calf. Yes. That, that they didn't get into that, but that's probably forgivable. But a God-given gift can be... Misused. Used or, or misused. So it's just an intriguing little glimpse mm. at spiritual gifts back in the Old Testament. Yeah. And you also have the gift of hospitality. Mm. And Abraham had the privilege of entertaining angels because he had that gift of hospitality, of inviting in the stranger... And I think sometimes that's a gift we, we don't sort of particularly value as much as we, we ought mm. because, you know, it is, it's kind of a critical part of being able to, to build up and have the body of Christ, that if you don't have anybody with hospitality, then it, it's like, I mean, you'll get the job done. But And I think one of the other really obvious examples of hospitality is Martha. Mm-hmm. Who had a sister, Mary. Mm. And, who, who did not have the gift of hospitality. <laughs> Mary would look much more was into knowledge, mm. sitting, learning and, and... Teaching even. Teaching. And so you've got Mary and Martha. And I, I, I kind of feel particularly in that little glimpse we get where Martha complains that Mary's not helping, that there's a sort of a, a misunderstanding of each other's gifts and... and you know, not understanding that, that Martha is not like Mary and Mary is not like Martha, but, but at the same time, if you look at the, the combination of somebody with hospitality and someone with teaching. You've got multiple examples of it is a powerful combination mm. to have a meal. To be, you know, to be inviting people in and making them feel welcome and loved, but also having somebody who can teach and grow them. Yeah can speak the truth in love. Mm. And so with Martha, we would say very much her gift was hospitality. Mary's is much more mercy and teaching. Mm. Um, and viva the, the combination, if we can work together and say, well, you know, hey, your gift of music is, is wonderful. And that's a gift that... It's not called a gift in there, but I, I believe it is. And I think particularly being able to have that focus and using them together makes something more, you know, allows the spirit to work in a much more powerful way than just sort of, you know, each of the little gifts cloistered around. We have another gift, and we might consider it to be one of the not the flashy ones. You know, the ones people seem to want are the flashy ones, the miracles, <laughs> the apostle, not so much administration, not serving. It's kind of the frontline ones, the, front the, one, line, the ones that are standing up the front. Spectacular, miraculous ones. Paul has just become a Christian up in Damascus. When he gets back to Jerusalem, he... The church is a little bit dubious. <laughs> he wants to join the church. Mm. And they know all about this man. They did not believe that he was a disciple. This I mean, to be fair, he's been trained to be killing them up until, like, what, last week? <laughs> you know, he's been, yeah, arresting them and throwing them into jail. And now he's saying, I'm a Christian and... Oh, yeah. But Barnabas. And when we first meet Barnabas, back in chapter 4, we're told that his name means son of encouragement. He lived up to that. <laughs> and, and back there he was selling stuff that he had so that he could care for people. Mm. Here is the son of encouragement, Barnabas. Takes Paul, brings him to the apostles. 
tells them how on the road he has seen the Lord, about how he's been preaching. And so Barnabas, the son of encouragement, brings this man who's on the outer and brings him. And like he's never sort of a really strong character, but you get little glimpses of, of his work all the way through Acts. Mm-hmm. And for a time he and Paul worked together. Paul much more had the gift of teaching. But again, if you have somebody with a gift of teaching and somebody with a gift of encouragement, Paul, Paul didn't always get the gift of encouragement <laughs> so much. But when you've got that combination, that's a powerful combination of, of gifts together. Mm-hmm. And we find Barnabas encouraging John Mark. Mm. and Even when Paul is, is <laughs> parting being, of the ways. Being difficult to live with, yes. And here is such a beautiful gift, mm. the gift of encouragement. And again, I think that's, that's one that isn't particularly sort of noticed or valued, but it is an important, really important gift in terms of building up the body and, and nurturing the community. And, and without the fruit of the Spirit, it's too easy to have the gift of discouragement. Mm. Or even like encouragement that is, is more empty flattery. Mm-hmm. that just sort of trying to make you feel good about yourself so that I can, you know, use it in manipulative or abusive ways. That and, and the gifts are good, but they need to be recognised, developed and, and used prayerfully mm. and, and not manipulatively. You know, God told me to tell you this. And, and also not in terms of it being about me because, like, you know, I might have these gifts, but when presented with a different situation, the spirit may give this gift to work through that situation even if it's not mm-hmm. inherently something that I'm normally working with, that it's it's about being instruments through which the spirit can work rather than about I have this gift, woohoo. And, and this is not that kind of a gift anyway. Mm. In fact, encouragement was only in one of the lists, wasn't it? Mm. Um, and then we have, you know, Philip. And in Acts chapter 21, he's known as Philip the Evangelist. Mm-hmm. But the first time that we meet Philip, that's not the gift that he's presenting <laughs> with. In, in Acts chapter 6, they, they had had the, the widows, well, the Greek widows being overlooked in the daily distribution. You know, there was no social security. And so the apostle said, well, look, find some men of faith and who can serve. So the gift of service, the gift of faith, and let's put them to do that task. I'd say a degree of gift of administration as well in this case. A gift of administration. And the apostles were realising, look, if we try to do everything, then we're going to miss things. And the other thing is, like, the Spirit hasn't gifted them to do everything. The Spirit has gifted them to do their thing. Which is prayer and the ministry of the Word. Mm. So let's find some men. And they found Stephen and Philip and five others and appointed them to do this job which they were gifted for. Mm. So they occupied their ministry, but by the time we get to chapter 21, Philip is not known as Philip the deacon. He's known as Philip the evangelist. And I wonder if this is kind of one of those cases like in the parable of the talents where when you use your your giftings and keep growing them, that, you know, they grow and change as your walk with God grows and changes. And as the needs in the Mm. situation this is his primary gift at this point in time. Mm. And the next verse tells us that his daughters also had some gifts. That they prophesied. They spoke on God's behalf. Which was significant enough in this for it to be included in the narrative. It, they don't just sort of include all sorts of random details. <laughs> it's not how the biblical writers work. And... Again, prophecy is a gift that is often misunderstood. Yeah. That we've got the idea that prophecy is about predicting the future. You know, this is going to happen and I predict this is going to happen for you. And even in the, the, the Bible and the Old Testament particularly, that's not 
typically how the prophecy worked, there was an element of predictiveness. So we talked about this last season that um, a lot of the predictiveness is if you keep going this way, then this is the, the consequence of what's going to happen. But the main role of a prophet was stabilising, bringing people who were starting to stray back, back in and speaking for God. Speaking on behalf of God. And here we have Philip's four daughters engaged in speaking for God, which I guess fulfilled what Joel said, that it'll come to pass in the last days your sons and daughters mm. will dream dreams and prophesy that here it is happening. God. I kind of wonder if there is some, you know, the, the person who's writing this down is, is remembering that and kind of seeing that erupting all around them. Well, Peter did quote it on the day of Pentecost. Um, that when it comes to giving gifts, it's nothing to do with your age. It's nothing to do with your gender. It's all to do with the Holy Spirit who gives them as, as he wills. Mm. And that it's a gift. It's, it's given. It's, it's not gift. earned. It's not... <laughs> that there's, you can't really sort of boast that I have this gift or anything because it's not yours. It's, it's a gift still. And that's really, I think, quite important mm. that it's not yours. You can't say it's mine because it was given to you. You can't boast, well, look what I've got mm. because it was... It was given to you. It was given to you as a gift. And, and I, I, I think one of the, the sort of natural responses to that in terms of, you know, if you are given this gift and gratitude is to mm. use it. That, you know, to sort of recognise that, okay, I've been given this gift. This is something I am good at. I can do this. Mm -hmm. and, and maybe that brings us to the point that we do need to be prayerfully saying, God, what is the gift that you've given to me? What is the need that I can be meeting in my community? And be continuing to, you know, recognise, develop, grow, that it's not just a you know, the gift is dumped on you, open it, and it looks like that. You just keep using that gift that way, that it grows and you've got to develop and invest time. It's got to be developed. Mm. Now, you know, one of your gifts, whether it's a natural gift or a spiritual gift, it's all God-given, whether it's through your mum and dad or through something supernatural, does the fact that you have a gift for music mean that you don't need to have Music lessons. No, no. Or, or you know, and, and still, like, the amount of time you have to invest in practice, in, in getting to understand it, in, in developing the skills. It's And for any gift, it is the same, that you have to keep learning, you have to keep practicing it, trying to understand it, digging deeper. So you recognise, you know, my voice is a gift, therefore I ought to go and get some lessons so that I can look after it, so that I can make it be all that it can be. Mm. But if God's given to us a gift, maybe the gift of knowledge, it doesn't say we now know it all. <laughs> it, In fact, I think if you're given the gift of knowledge, you, you have an even greater awareness how much you don't know because there is, there is just sort of you, there's a basic understanding of, of how vast this is. But, but you have the ability to process mm. and sort through the vast amount of knowledge there is and put it into a digestible form mm. for... For people who don't have that gift. <laughs> it's not to show off and say, well, you know, look at me, look how much I know. Um, be cautious of that kind of teacher. It's, again, it's supposed to come back to helping each other and building the body up. That their knowledge is there to be a, a resource for the whole body, not for them. And we have just sort of this consistent pattern. It's connection with fruit. Mm -hmm. It's need to be resourcing and building up the body. And, you know, the, the unity and all the gifts being equal and, and important and valued. But the, these three themes just keep coming up th throughout. That there is no gift that is more important. Mm. That any gift, if we are deficient in the body, mm. to that extent the body is... And, you know, somebody who has the gift of hospitality and can invite <laughs> someone around for lunch and care for them or, you know, see a need in their community and care for that, that isn't less important than somebody who can go and run an evangelistic series. And Dorcas, who saw the, the widows and the young mums in her community and just all she did was sewed clothes. Mm. She saw a need. Hang on, did I say <laughs> all she did? 
that was equally important as Peter preaching mm. on the day of Pentecost. That a gift needs to be recognised, it needs to be developed. And I think this is one of the things that they are going through and learning and, and grappling with in the early church, that suddenly you've got the Spirit popping up with gifts everywhere and that, you know, it's not just, you know, the leadership team that's, mm -hmm. that the Spirit is equipping all of the people. And that's, you know, this is why it's spreading so much, that the Spirit is kind of moving through all of them. And we will find satisfaction. We'll find our place. Mm. We'll actually find relationships when we actually realise that we complement each other, that we can work together for a particular project mm. for the cause of God. That is more than you could do on your own, but at the same time what you bring to it is important. So our gifts need to be used for God and for others. Mm. If that's not their purpose, then we're misusing yep. the gifts that are there, and that's a really big red flag. If it's not for the common good of the group. Then it's it's problematic. It's problematic. So we are on a, a journey of discovery. We've begun looking at spiritual gifts today. We haven't had time to go in to, to pull out each gift. There's too much. There's about 20 that were in the lists that we looked at today. And I, like I said, you know, it's, it's situationally done. It's, those lists themselves aren't exhaustive. But if we look at each of the gifts and say, what is this? How does it work? Then it may help us to find mm -hmm. what our one is. If we say, what is it that we, what would we really feel that we like to do? Mm. You know? God puts desires in our hearts. And if we're willing to follow them, then he provides the gifting to meet it. And I think, you know, looking at this question, here is a need, how can I help? Sometimes it's really easy to kind of go, well, I don't know what my gifting is. Um, and knowing what your gift is, isn't actually the prerequisite for starting. That starting with a, you know, here is a need, how can I help? Like doing what we can. Mm -hmm. And the needs that we're going to be directed to are going to be the needs that kind of, you know, that we're kind of equipped to help with. In some way. So God will help us to see the needs that correspond with the gifts mm. that he wants to give to us. And I think, like, in terms of us being able to identify and grow our gifts, mm. that, you know, we, we have to start by moving, not start by waiting for the gift to arrive, because the gift is already there. You just, you know, it's learning to see, desiring to strengthen other people's faith to build them up and going, you know, how can I help? And how can I be the person that God wants me to be mm. and not try just to be a copy of the person that God has made these people to be? If they are using their gifts, that's, that's wonderful. Let's not try to be copies of them, but instead to say, what is the place that God has given to us mm. to fill? And we're going to leave you to explore that, to reflect upon it, to pray about it. What is the need that God's helping you to see? And that will help you to find the gifts that he's giving to you to meet these needs. In our next episode, we're going to be exploring a little bit more about knowledge and truth as it relates to the life of the Christian. We look forward to seeing you next week on Working the Word.